Hello, everybody. Right. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, if it's your first time with us, I want to welcome you. Uh, and I hope everybody in the chat room will make an effort to welcome anybody if you recognize them as a, a newcomer. Uh, <clears throat> I hope this uh, experience tonight is a blessing for you. And maybe you'll want to join the congregation uh, every Wednesday and Sunday. We have a Sunday program also. Uh, uh, so uh, if, if you're a regular participant, a regular, regular member of the congregation, welcome back. And uh, I don't know if we're going to have uh, be hit hard by the trolls tonight or not, but uh, if you're uh, if you do have a wrench, let me give Gen V a wrench here. here hang on, Gen V. Okay. Gen V, I see you didn't have a wrench there, so now, now you should have one. But if you have the wrench, or if you're a moderator, uh, please help us out. And if anybody comes into the chat room that is getting ugly, or if you're a troll, uh, put a stop to it immediately, okay? This is for fellowship, uh, not for, uh, you know, a place to everybody fight and argue. Uh, all right, before we get into the Bible study, or Romans chapter 5, beginning with verse 1, let me have... Uh, uh, Steve and Cripps introduced themselves. I'm going to call on you instead of hope you guys, you know, let you guys decide because you can never decide whose turn it is. So I'm going to call on you. Uh, Brother Steve, uh, tell them who you are and uh, if, if someone doesn't know you. Hello, I am Steve, soldier for Christ. We are at war because we indeed are. Um, uh, the closer we get to the final days, the the, wor the worst I believe that the warfare will be, and we're already at a fever pitch. So uh, that's that's my name. That's my channel, Soldier for Christ. We are at war. And uh, if you go ahead and go over there, subscribe and hit the hit the bell. Uh, I'm going to be starting to put out new content and about another. A week or two, uh, so. Uh, but uh, hi to the chat room. Glad you're all here. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Luke. Uh, and uh, it's always a pleasure to be on a panel with with you, Jason, as well. Uh, so, uh, thanks for having me tonight. Uh, pray that the Bible study will be fruitful and edifying to the brethren. Uh, and uh, as uh, our buddy Matthias would say, the sister in, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and that uh, if someone is not saved, that they would, uh, that this would be the broadcast that would bring them to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, you're all right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Steve. Okay. Brother Cripps, uh, tell them who you are for those people who are meeting you for the first time. Sure, no problem. First of all, Steve, uh, I'm very, very impressed that you finally got the name of your own channel correct. That that, that that's a banner day. You just you didn't him or haw or anything. Just just came right out with it. Soldier for Christ, we are at war right now. <laughs> nice job, Steve. Okay, uh, my name's uh, Jason Cripps, and I have a channel, part of a, a panel uh, on a True Story Live, which comes on Sunday at nine. Uh, definitely most of the people in here that I see already are certainly aware of that. But if you're listening to the playback, come check us out on Sundays. Thanks for that little plug. And I also would like to say hello to the chat room. And I'll piggyback off Steve and, and uh, agree with everything you said about being at war. And uh, just uh, stand in solidarity with our, um, I think you could just say brethren, you don't, I don't think you have to say brethren and sistren, right? Just the body of Christ. I'll, I'll, I'll go that route with the stand with the body and um, just be ready. And we can do that. And these Bible studies are definitely a way in which we can help prepare for the kind of wars that we're fighting. And we're using the sword, which is his word, and uh, using it the best way possible also with fellowship. So uh, welcome, folks, in the chat room. Glad to see each and every one of you and um, excited about tonight. Thanks, Brother Luke. And uh, I will also agree that it's always a pleasure to be on any panel with Steve. We get along uh, really, really well, except when he says, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And other than that, it's all good. Looking forward to it. Thank you. <laughs> all right. 
Well, I was surprised to hear you see refer to Matthias using the term cistern. I, I've never heard him say it, but I, I do say that. I I was uh, felt awkward thinking of the sisters uh, as brethren, so I I called them cistern. I said I don't know if there is really such a word. Probably not. But uh, is Matthias has he adopted that word or? Are you just confusing us? I don't know. But uh, welcome, brothers and sisters all. So whatever, whatever the proper term is, it's fine. Uh, now, um, everybody's probably uh, wondering, well, where's Sister Renee? Where has she been this last week? <clears throat> uh, unless you haven't been paying attention, she has been very, very uh, sick and actually really disabled from doing anything. Uh, for the last week or maybe maybe it's been almost two weeks now and <clears throat> I've been trying to give everybody updates uh, as I as I learn about her condition and her, we're all praying for progress and for healing uh, so I'm trying to stay in touch and give you a report she just gave me a, a message a few minutes ago saying that it was giving me permission to share with you the correspondent we had earlier today so I just wrote her a text because she didn't answer the phone see she, I don't think she's even in a position to even have a conversation on the phone and, and she's in real extreme pain so um, she doesn't answer the phone and but she does able to reply back up with a text so I just said how are you doing today and she said pain was so severe I could not drive or use my right leg to drive to doctor. Uh, I started communion and will do it daily. It was in my spirit to do so, hoping for some healing. Feel insane from constant pain with no sleep. And then there's an audio message. Found something in scripture that the two witnesses are not people, the groups of people. So I was going to do a video, but I can't concentrate long enough and I can't sit down. So I'm hoping I can get well enough to at least do that video. And the second message from her is, let me see. There's a second audio message. Let me see if I can find it now. Oh, there he is. Put on my spirit last night to start doing communion because his body was broken for our healing. So I, I did that today and I will be doing it every day. All right. And then the last thing is I, I sent her a message back asking if I had permission to share her, her message with you. So there you go. Um, status report. Sadly, it's not really a progress report because I'm not seeing any progress in her condition. So um, everybody, I know everybody's praying for Sister Renee, and let's keep on praying for her. It, it, it breaks my heart that she's uh, suffering with extreme pain, and it doesn't seem like there's any medical remedy available. Uh, okay, so uh, I hope that she gets back together when she's feeling well and is able to join us again. She's normally with me every Sunday and Wednesday. Uh, okay, uh, Sarah Jane writes, and Luke, could you find out if she needs help with Christmas for Jim Jim? I have a feeling, or I ask her, she'll say no, so maybe you could poke around about it to her. I don't think she's going to uh, say Yes, and because she's not the one that is ever wants to solicit. But if you go to any of her videos in the description box, there's a um, instructions on how to send uh, support for her ministry. So Sarah Jane, if you or anybody else wants to help her out for Christmas or in any other way, uh, that's that's how you can do it. And I'm glad you brought that up. I hope I hope many people will do it. Okay. Uh, all right, we're, uh, you guys have anything you want to say bef before we get into the, uh, the text? All right, then. OK, 
Okay, let's go with, uh, we're on Romans chapter 5. Uh, by the way, I, I want to say that um, some of you have been uh, participating in these Wednesday Bible studies for months, and uh, you're up to date on all of our studies. Um, but there is a playlist on my channel called Wednesday Night Bible Studies, so you can go back there and archive and access all the studies we've done, uh, particularly in since we started studying the book of Romans so that you can get the context of this book. It's very, very important. We The first couple of uh, weeks uh, on studying Romans, we, I think, did a, a very important teaching on the context of the book as a whole. And <clears throat> so that's important to have that in mind as we, as we continue forward. But as of today, we're going to begin with chapter 5, verse 1. So let me... Uh, I'm going to, I thought I had it here. Huh. Well, I'm going to have to pull it up again. I somehow, I'm always clicking things and then losing something. Oh, there it is. I didn't lose it. I just couldn't find it. Okay. Uh, let me, I'm going to post, uh, five verses here uh, in the private chat for you, Brother Cripps, and, and just so you have all that in front of you. We have a private chat space, and then you have the public chat room. And, and uh, okay, so reading from the KJV, it says, uh, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. All right, uh, Brother Cripps, uh, I'm going to ask you first to give me your thoughts on those first two verses. There's a period, by the way, at the end of that word God. So we know that Paul tends to run on, his thoughts are like run on sentences. And they can, sometimes we have four, five, six verses before there's actually a period. But here we have the first two verses should be a, 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 an entire thought. So let, let me hear your thoughts on those first two verses, Brother Cripps. Well, it's in interesting. Um, I would think that they're they're both very, very separate points uh, that stand alone. But I'll 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 tackle both of them. Therefore, being justified by faith, this is wonderful and beautiful. Um, so it's it's saying he's saying right from the get go that it's faith that we're justified by. So last week we of course talked about what we're not justified with. Everybody remembers that. So here again, he's pounding on the same thing, that faith is the way that we're justified. And uh, also, what comes with that? We have peace with God. We're not at war. We're not at enmity with God like those who do not know him. We know him, therefore, we're justified by our faith, and we have peace with him. And who do we have the peace with God? Who do we have it through? And he answers that question, our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's what Christ did on the cross, his finished work. We have peace through our faith. So then verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith. He's going over the same point again, into the grace. So this is the mechanism in which uh, we're standing, which is the, his, his grace that he gives us. So this is the imputed righteousness. This is what we stand in every day of our lives as a believer. We stand in the grace. And what a beautiful place it is to stand, my friends. Absolutely. And rejoice. Here's the beautiful thing. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, the coming of, of, the, of the Savior again to come get us, the glory of him. Uh, and gosh, I look forward to that very much. Um, I'm learning to have joy in this world, which is something I struggled with for a long time. What helps is to be able to rejoice in that hope that we have. And gosh, I hope that each one of you has a lot of hope. I know I certainly have. Um, he's grown me in that. And I, even though I struggled with it before, I, I, I have to admit that I, I, even though I knew I had grace, 
it was hard for me to rejoice in that. It was hard. It was it was easy for me to get bogged down by the things of this world and forget that I should be rejoicing that I have hope in the glory of God. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, brother. Okay, brother, brother Steve. Tell us what you think of those verses. Oh, J Jason <clears throat> said a lot there. Um, I, I, <laughs> I love it. I love what you said there, Jason. And, uh, and uh, if you're listening last week, you would hear my, you would have heard my uh, explanation on the word therefore, which means basically, quote, what, because of what I've already written, the next words I'm going to speak are my are a summation point of what was already of what I've already wrote. So therefore, because of what I wrote before, being justified by faith, so he's saying, because of what I wrote before, we are justified by faith, not by works, not by circumcision, not by, you know, the, the various things that Paul argued against. But no, we're justified by faith. And this is one of those verses, one of those verses where alone isn't stated, but it's implied. So therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Why do we have peace with God? Because when we, prior to being saved by grace, by believing the gospel, we were enemies with God and did not have peace with God because we were sinners not who had not received yet the forgiveness of sins that comes by faith that Jesus has already paid for, but it's by faith that we receive it and thereby have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't say through, through Steve. It doesn't say through uh, yourself. It doesn't say through Jason. It doesn't say through Luke. It doesn't say through works. It doesn't say through anything, but through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by faith, we are justified and then have peace with God. I mean, that, that, that statement alone is just such a profound statement that, that when, you, then you, when you look at it in its essence, it, it, there's no works mentioned in that, in, that, in that partial sentence. Like Luke was saying, he, Paul loves run-on sentences. <laughs> so, by whom, verse 2, it, so this is through Jesus. So not only do we have peace with God, we also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. So this grace is something we are standing in, standing on, and it's through Jesus Christ. By faith, we stand in this grace, we have peace with God, and we also, through Jesus, by faith, rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What is that glory of God? That is our, our glorified bodies that we receive upon either death or... Um, or at the at the second resurrection so um and it's all accomplished through jesus by faith we have peace with god we have access into the grace wherein we stand which is another way of saying we have we stand in the grace of the gospel the death burial and resurrection that's what we're standing in standing on <clears throat> because there's no other foundation which can be laid with than Jesus Christ. So, and because of that, we rejoice. And one day, 
being given a glorified body and, and being able to stand in the presence of God with imputed righteousness and washed away, our sin washed away forever. All right, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, let me say to the chat room, um, I want to remind everybody that uh, if you want to get my attention, please make your statement in all caps. And that, in, that is, includes if you just want to make a point that you want us to respond to, or if you have a question you want us to answer, if you make it all caps, it'll stand out. I'm trying to read all the comments, but uh, it'll, if, it's, if you shout at me with all caps, then you'll get my attention. So you're shouting in this case is a good thing, right? Uh, you'll get my attention that way. Um, but <laughs> Steve, <laughs> I couldn't help but laugh, but Brother Hendricks, here's a message he says for you. Geez, Brother Steve, save some of it for the rest of the verses, LOL. <laughs> okay, that was intended in fun though, but- uh, I, I know, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> all right so the um uh, oh i lost my private chat thing here for a second let me let me see if i get that back there it is okay this sometimes you click the wrong thing and it can really mess things up here um well i've asked brother cribs and brother steve here to uh, after i read the verse to amplify the verses it means expound upon the verses tell me a little bit more about what that verse means and we, all, we happen to have a bible translation called the amplified translation <clears throat> and i like to use that because it's like having a, another an expert with us i don't agree with the experts who uh, made who wrote the amplified version i don't agree with them 100 percent, but almost all the time i find it to be very helpful so I'm going to read these verses in the Amplified, and I think we'll see some uh, interesting points that are worth talking about. It says, therefore, now this therefore, by the way, uh, Brother Steve, it, it's a good point. It, 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 we, we saw a therefore, um, uh, Paul's used this several times in this letter so far, the word therefore. And it is basically, basically there's a verse that he says, therefore, we conclude so he's saying, uh, based on what I've been telling you, therefore, here's the conclusion you, I want you to draw based on everything I just said previously. And so we can say, therefore, we conclude, <clears throat> since we have been justified, that is, acquitted of sin, declared blameless before God by faith. So here they're kind of defining for us justified. Now, you know, justified doesn't always mean th this, but of course, when it's referring to salvation, that's what it's talking about, that acquitted of sin. And that's, you're not guilty of sin. You're declared blameless before God. That's also what the word sanctified means. You're declared righteous. You're declared holy. You're separated, set apart, and declared by God. This is a group of people who are blameless. They're acquitted. They're holy and righteous. Uh, by faith. Now, Steve, that was a good point you made, I think, when you talked about how faith alone. Now, the word, it doesn't say faith alone there. It's not explicit, as you said, uh, like it is in the verse, I, I remember, I think it's Romans 3, maybe 324, if I remember right, it says, therefore, we conclude the man is that man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So here we have a verse that is explicit and actually tells us, not, you're not only justified by faith, but without the deeds of the law. So nothing could be more clear to make, every, everybody should understand from that verse, and there's others like it, that it not only is saying you're justified by faith, but he says, but and also, no law, no law is required. I wanna make that clear. Nothing else is required. No, nope, no religious works on your part, only faith. Uh, but, Steve, you made a good point. Um, brother uh, Jason Jack and I did a, a playlist 
called 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone. And some verses were clear like the one I just cited. And others, they simply said, like John 3.16, for example, uh, their verses like that, they say you're saved by believing or you're saved by, by here. In this verse, it says you're saved by faith. So does it really say faith alone? Yeah, it implies faith alone because nothing else is in the verse. If anything else was was needed besides just the faith, then it would have to be included. Otherwise, we have to say it's faith alone. Nothing else is required. Otherwise, it would have to be included. The only thing that that is um, offered to us as our uh, for our means of salvation is faith. Therefore, it is faith alone. So um, there there are some that verses that go out of the way to say, yeah, hey, uh, not by any works like Ephesians. Two, eight, and nine. It, it it spells it out for us. No, not by works. And, and then there's other verses like this. It's really saying faith alone, because nothing else is in the verse. To it's only the only thing in there cited is faith. Therefore, oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to pull up the amplified again here. Okay. Um, then it says by faith. Let us grasp the fact that. We have peace with God. Now, when he says, let us grasp the fact that his grace, uh, by, uh, we have, so uh, obviously in the KJV, it doesn't say let us grasp the fact. That's part of their amplification. Paul, they, they believe that Paul is saying, basically, we need to understand this. You need to grasp this. This is an important fact for you to get. Uh, let us grasp the fact that we have peace with God and the joy of reconciliation with him. Um, so we, we encounter people all the time that want to argue with this, that God is angry with us and you, and you, you better watch out. You know, uh, you, God, you better not sin. God's angry with you. You don't have to pay for those sins. But the verse the Bible is telling us that no, God's not angry. We have peace with God and we have reconciliation. Reconciliation means that, hey, you've made up. We, you know, the, the, the problem between man and God, uh, it doesn't exist anymore because it's been reconciled by Jesus. It says, through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed. Then in verse two, they write, through him, we also have access by faith into this remarkable state of grace in which we firmly and safely and securely stand. Let us rejoice in our hope and the confident assurance of experiencing. Now see, in the KJV, we see the word hope. Uh, let me see in verse two, where does it say that? Oh, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. But in the Amplified, the word hope is there. It says, uh, let us rejoice in our hope, and they expound, and the confident assurance of, that is the experiencing and enjoying of the glory of our, well, let me just say that hope is a beautiful word. If you look up the word hope in the dictionary, you're not going to get the meaning that, that the, the Bible really wants you to, to get. And, you're, and the word hope is, is jumped upon by the lordship heretics. And when they see the word hope, they'll use that word hope to try to make you have some doubt. See, well, you're hoping for it, but you're not really assured of it. You're just, you're hoping, got your fingers crossed. No, this hope is the way that the Amplified is, wants us to get it. I'm glad that they, they amplify it this way. When it says hope and the confident assurance so it's, it's not the kind of hope that the world says, well, I hope that happens. I'm not really sure. This hope that we have is the confident assurance of experiencing and enjoying the glory of our great God. And uh, it, says, it says in the KJV, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. But in the Amplified, it says the glory of our great God the manifestation of his excellence and power. Um, I think the amplification they did there uh, is beautiful. 
And it just drives home the point that this is not just God, it's our great God. And it's not just hope, but it's really a confident assurance. And so uh, I think they did an excellent job expounding upon that as, as well as I or any of us could do. Um, okay, you guys want to say any more about that before we move to uh, next verses? Either of you? I'm ready for the next one. Okay. I could say something real quick. Go ahead. I thought I thought that was awesome that that you know the hope part that it's not just hope, but like like confident hope that's like uh, more solid than cement, you know. Uh, but, uh, and you said uh, you know justification and sanctification you were talking about, and uh, how I've understood justification and sanctification, I think they both occur. I mean, I do believe they both occur at the same time. I think uh, justification, from what I understand, and that's, you know, uh, that justification is literally just as if I have never sinned. So that's like sin is a negative uh, bank balance. So justification removes sin from my, my, my bank account. Now I'm at zero. But I need... I need a positive bank balance. In fact, I need perfect bank balance. So God gives me his imputed righteousness and sanctifies me and declares me holy. So I'm declared, uh, I'm in justification, I'm declared sinless. In sanctification, I'm declared holy given the imputed righteousness. So uh, that's how I understand those two words to mean but they both happen at the same time upon belief. But I, I think the understanding of those two words is, is important because, you know, of the way they're used. Um, and I think maybe also at the time that Paul wrote it, he's like, it, you know, Jesus didn't just wipe your slate clean. You know, he also put infinity righteousness into your account as well. So you're not relying upon yourself to keep your bank balance, uh, uh, you know, clean and below and above zero. It, 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 we rely on Jesus because he gives us that imputed righteousness and that infinity bank account that of grace that is forever covering us from, from our, from our sin. So it's, it's both sin removed and imputed righteousness, justification, sanctification. If that helps anybody understand the difference between those two words. All right. Now I have to talk about those words a little bit more again. Uh, okay. Ju justified is, justified is, is, uh, could be considered a legal term. Uh, it's like before, if you uh, go to court and you plead your case, you're trying to justify yourself before the, the, the judge. And uh, if we go before Jesus, a judgment, and he says, why should I let you into heaven? And you, you're trying to justify why, well, I've been pretty good. I, I'm, I go to church. I do that. Well, you can't be justified by your works, the Bible says. He'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. But if, if we plead the blood of Jesus, he, he died for my sins, then, then that's the justification that will actually uh, that saves us. So it's a legal term saying you're not guilty. You are justified. But the sanctified, you know, I know that most people we know, they will say that sanctified should be understood as, as a, an event and a process. An event is when you believe uh, you're sanctified at that moment. Uh, but then as you, you, you have your Christian walk over the years, you, it's a process of being sanctified. I don't really like to use sanctified in the second sense. I mean, I don't, I'm not going to argue with anybody about it. If they, they want to use it, I understand what they mean. I like to, to just use the, the process of, uh, for the, they call sanctification. I just call that spiritual growth and maturity because uh, I, I want to keep this the sanctified as, as an event, like, like uh, the other things that happen at the moment you believe uh, that sanctified means you're, there's, definitions and uh, Bible definitions that apply to sanctifier, you're set apart. In other words, imagine God is looking at a group of people 
And he sees Steve has this white robe of righteousness he's wearing. And so he picks Steve up and he says, okay, I'll set you over here. And uh, no, they don't have the robe. You know, oh, Brother Cripps, he, he has a white robe of righteousness. I'll put him over here. I'll set him apart and set him over here in this, this group over there. You're set apart from the rest. And at the same time, you're declared holy. You're declared righteous because you're, you're covered with the righteousness of Jesus. Um, so that's how I would... Uh, I use the word sanctified, and, and I, I, I'd like to see everybody do it, but if they want to say you're also sanctified as a process of growing and maturing in, in your uh, uh, spiritual maturity, that, that, that I accept that. Um, all right, let me go to the next verse 3. Uh, okay, I'll read 3. Uh, there, there might be more. I don't know how far this thought goes here. Um, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the, Lord, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Okay, let Steve go first on this, verses 3, 4, and 5. Oh, Steve, boy. <laughs> Steve, amplify those verses for us, please. Uh, I, I would do so. I will. I will attempt to do so. All right. Um, obviously, this is a continuation of verses 1 and 2. That by faith, we're justified. By faith, we have peace with God. Now, all this through Jesus Christ, our, our Lord. So by faith, through Jesus Christ, we have justification. We have peace with God, sanctification. And we have the grace of God, which is the gospel, wherein we stand, how we got that. And the, the hope that we get our glorified body later. And then not only so, but also by faith, we glory in tribulations. So uh, like Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble. <laughs> Period. It's coming. It's going to happen. But I'll be with you through it. So because we know Jesus will be with us through it, we, by faith, we glory in our tribulations. Why? Why, do, why would we glory in trouble? Paul why why would we be be glad and rejoice and and uh and give god glory and praise and honor through tribulations why well he explains it because we know knowing that tribulation worketh patience tribulation helps you grow patience and and thereby that same patience because that patience grows we have experience in, in in our life through patience and that experience begets more experience in patience and also in experience in hope the same hope that we're talking about the hope of the glory of god the hope of the resurrection the hope of of being united with christ uh, someday that that is the hope of our calling the the hope that that we long for to see Jesus face to face to, you know um, and that hope does not make us ashamed it doesn't condemn us but that hope makes us not ashamed like Paul says I am not ashamed of the of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It's a beautiful thing. It's not something to be ashamed of, and it doesn't make me ashamed. But it and it does not condemn me. Because, 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 like here's why. This is why it does not make us ashamed. This is why we, we glory in our tribulations, not just to to grow in patience and experience and experience in our and you know having that grow our hope as we walk through life with Jesus but most of all 
because the love of God is, was, and is being shed abroad in our hearts. That love of God should, should be because of these tribulations that we glory in. We praise God through as, as we walk through them and grow, like Luke was saying, grow in our walk in, in grace and maturity so that the love of God grows in our hearts and is shed abroad in our hearts. Ghost, not, not by us, by the Holy Ghost. Not by works, but by the Holy Ghost. By faith, all these things is how it's being accomplished. Through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, which was given to us because Jesus left. He said, I will send a comforter unto you. Uh, if I stay, the comforter can't come. But because he left, the comforter could come and dwell in us and shed the love of Christ abroad in our hearts. And as we grow and walk in maturity, which is what this is talking about, through the tribulations of life, that we grow in maturity and that love grows even, even broader as we lean on him through life's tribulations so that out of the depths of our being, that, that flowing river of water will flow out of us and pour onto others so that they may see our, our good works, not for our salvation, but for them to see and glorify God who is in heaven and experience the grace of God for themselves in being saved. Okay. All right, Brother Cripps. All right, chomping at the bit for this one. So for verse three, I could spend a half an hour just on that alone. Um, I'll I'll use a personal reference to my own life. I mean, I think that that's the best way to describe things sometimes, and people can get get a good idea uh, why this verse is so special to me. Why this whole chapter uh, five one through eight at least is extremely um, important to me in my life. It's one of the first. Uh, I may have mentioned this before, but it bears repeating. Um, in second grade, it was the first verse, uh, first chapter of scripture that I ever memorized as part of my, my Christian school. And it had stayed with me no matter where I've gone, no matter what things I was doing, whether I was running from God or not running from God, whatever the case may be. These verses keep coming back to me again and again and again. And the one that I didn't understand fully was verse three. Uh, glory and tribulations. How, how do we glory in tribulations? When we face the things in this world, uh, you know, whether it be dead or losing a job or your car breaks down at the worst possible time or you have sickness like a lot of what Renee is dealing with. Um, also, even the tribulations of, of people on the outside, so-called believers that, that keep trying to drag you down. I mean, these are tribulations. These are real things that people face in their life. How do we glory in that? How is it possible that we even would have the strength to deal with all these things that come against us? Well, if we understand the rest of these verses, if we, he, Paul explains it to us. We know, we know that tribulation worketh patience. So we get the, you know, Steve did a really good job of explaining it, but I, you know, I'll go through it from my perspective. In my life, when these tribulations came, I knew this verse, but it was a practical understanding that had to be worked out in me of seeing the patients begin to change. Because at first, the you know, I, up until the time I was in my late 30s, I'd never experienced much tribulation in my life, just being completely honest. I mean, I had basic little things happen, but, but never like what I would go through in my late 30s. And uh, I lived all uh, up until that time without experiencing a lot of it. And, and to be honest with you, my perception was skewed. For me, I have to learn. I have to go through it in order to truly understand it. And God walked through it with me and understanding that he was making me patient. If you pray for patience, be careful what you pray for, because sometimes we have to go through tribulation in order to learn it. And then when we learn it, we have experience. So that's exactly what I'm talking about and going through it, going through the tribulation and learning that it work, works patience in us. We have experience. And with the more experience we have after more tribulation and after more patience, we have more experience. And then we feel that hope spring 
from inside us. It doesn't come from the outside. It comes from in the inside because we have a relationship with the spirit of God, as, as uh, Steve had referenced, he gave us a comforter. He is so much more than a comforter, but that's the, the, that is a, a, an excellent way to say it is that he's our comforter that was sent for us. And he's with us through all the tribulations that we go through. So we get the experience and then we have the hope that springs in us. And what does the hope do? It doesn't make us ashamed. We're not ashamed of the hope that we have. So when these tribulations keep coming, because they will continue to come, we can glory in them and be and not be ashamed of the hope that we have. Even when people accuse us and they rail against us and call us heretics or whatever the case may be, we're able to cling to that idea, that, that hope that we have that comes from within us, from the Holy Spirit. Because it's love. The love of God is shed abroad. Shed abroad is a big word, abroad. What does that mean? I mean, if we talk about abroad, the face of the earth, you know, that's that's a pretty large space, but it's even a bigger space when we're talking about the love of God. It covers everything. It absolutely covers everything. So what's in our hearts and what happens when we have that kind of love spring up in our hearts, we have to share it. That's what happens that when... When the verses in the Bible talk about the, the, the uh, cup runneth over, it's not even just about blessings. The, the love of God is the blessing, and we have to pour it out on other people. And when we, when we do that, they, they can receive some of that love from us, and they can pass it along to other people. It's, it's a never-ending source that comes inside of us. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, so we get that through the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. It's the gift of God, which is his love for us that uh, ties all these uh, verses together. Thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, well, verse three there, uh, uh, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Uh, Brother Krebs, you were very wise when, when you said that uh, be careful what you pray for. I Many, many years ago, I actually prayed for patience. Um, but I stopped praying for patience, even though it is a shortcoming for me. I've always been tr troubled with not having enough patience. But uh, so I recognized that in myself and I wanted to be more patient. So I prayed for it. But I realized this verse is saying that uh, in order to get patience, don't you have to go through some tribulation and trials and, in order to build up your 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 patience? How, how can you have patience if you haven't had situations in your life that required patience? Um, so I decided that I didn't really want to have so much patience. I, I quit play, praying for patience for that reason. I don't really desire some people. Maybe you're just braver than me or something. And you don't, uh, you'll approach it differently. But um, uh, so glory and tribulations. But when, here, that, that, is a, that is a very important thing to understand. If we do have tribulations, and we all do. Unfortunately, even though I quit praying for patience because I didn't want the tribulations, it, I didn't escape tribulations. <laughs> oh, God. But, you know, the tribulations really didn't come from the atheists and the secular world and just, you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 the non-believers. The, the tribulations have come from the uh, professing Christians. <clears throat> that has been the biggest shock. And, and disappointment of my life is that so many people who name Jesus as their savior uh, are capable of such hatefulness. We've seen it recently. I've seen it for many, many years. It's, it's always out there. And it's a, it's a really stain on Christianity. And it's, it's really a barrier preventing people from coming to Jesus because they see 
you know, how, like I said, Gandhi said, I love your Christ, but you, you Christians are so unchristlike. So uh, I've had, I haven't escaped tribulations, but the surprising and the shocking thing is the tribulations always coming from people who say they believe and yet they want to persecute the other people in the church. Um, so you really, and, and patience, experience, yeah. So to, you have to go through experiences if you want to develop that patience. And hope maketh not ashamed. Uh, let, me, let me read this part in the Amplified here. I'll read the whole thing on the Amplified, uh, verse, uh, starting with verse 3. And not only this, but with joy, let us exult in our sufferings and rejoice in our hardships, knowing that hardship... That is distress, pressure, trouble, produces patient endurance. And endurance, proven character. That's his spiritual maturity. And proven character, hope, and confident assurance of eternal salvation. Such hope in God's promises never disappoints us because God's love has been abundantly poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Uh, again, the Amplified emphasizes this, uh, this uh, hope and confident assurance of eternal life, of eternal salvation, it says. Um, all right. Uh, the pattern, of course, is I'm, I ask each of you to uh, comment, and then after we're all commenting, if anybody thinks of something else they want to add, I give another a chance for a follow-up. So do either of you have more to say about this before we move on? Okay. All right. Let's 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 move on then. And it says, and that was verse 5. And Brother Cripps, I, I have 6 through 10 in the private chat area. It says, um, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet, peradventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm going to stop there. So that's six, seven, and eight. And uh, let me see. Uh, I think it's brother. Who, whose turn is to go first on this one? I can't remember who went first last time. That would be Jason. Okay. You mean Crips? He wants to be called Crips, you know. Brother Crips? <laughs> no, I'm still here. I was waiting for Steve to respond. Uh, yeah. Um, if it's your turn to go first, I lost track. So if it's your turn to go first, go ahead, six, seven, and eight. Uh, expound on that, please. I'd, I'd be glad to. And Steve, you as, as a brother, you can call me Jason. You can call me Crips. I do, uh, Brother Luke is correct. I generally, a lot of my friends call me Crips, but uh, I do respond also to Jason. So it's no problem whatsoever. So thanks, uh, Steve. Um, verse six, for when we were yet without strength, and that means um, from the beginning of time and through, throughout all time without Christ, we do not have strength. We have no power to do anything without Christ. So that means we're dead. When, when the Holy Spirit comes in, we are quickened. He, they, he makes that spirit alive in us. But before that, we're dead and we do not have strength. And, and Christ did this. He died for everyone, the ungodly. Who's ungodly? Well, before Christ came, everyone was ungodly, except the ones that the you know that God decided were uh, saved because of their own faith, even before Christ was on the cross. But it's it's basically everyone. So everyone's ungodly before before Christ came, and after until they accept His free gift. That was that was pretty. I mean, it's a it's a it's a fantastic ber uh, verse, and all the power is in that. The fact that we are dead in sin before we are alive in what Christ did on the cross for us. So he died for the ungodly. Uh, seven is, is, is very, very good and makes so much sense. Um, it's talking about uh, in, in, uh, in manhood and being a man and being involved in society, um, a righteous man. So you think of the best man that you can possibly think of. 
And uh, would he be willing to die for another good man? That's the first part of the question. Would would someone, Paul is saying here, no. I mean, he's saying that, nah, scarcely, scarcely for a righteous man will one die. That, it, to, to translate that in modern, modern day terms, um, what man's going to give up his life for another good man? Uh, not not many. I mean, you have quote unquote heroes that save people out of cars that are stuck in the water, and they're mostly paramedics, though. But you know, occasionally you have a passerby that would would save someone, regardless of whether they knew they were a good man or not. But knowingly to just willingly give up your life for even a good man, uh, uh, it says some. So some would even dare to die. There's some that might do it. Um, but God commendeth His love toward us that in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we've already established when were we yet sinners? Well, before before we accept his gift, the gift of salvation, we're yet sinners. So before any of us listening to this uh, show tonight, long before any of us were even born, he already finished the work on, on the cross for our sins. That's very clear. And at whatever point uh, you became a believer, if you haven't become a believer, then the moment that you do that, then his finished work gives you the imputed righteousness that we've all talked about and love so well. Um, verse 9, much more than being, oh, no, we didn't stop. We, we did through 8, correct? 6, 7, and 8? Okay. Um, commendous love toward us. All right, I guess I've covered it. Um, I'll stop there. Uh, just some, I, I, I just got to tell you, I saw some, comments in the uh, chat earlier about loving Romans. Uh, oh, it was uh, Poofy Scruffy. And I know you're going to go over this, Luke, but I just saw I couldn't help notice with all the hearts on there. Um, I want to agree with that. I also love Romans. It probably is um, uh, next to Job, probably one of my favorite uh, books of the Bible. So it's a pleasure to be in it. All right. Thanks. All right. Brother Steve. Um, can I take my turn after you, uh, uh, amplify it your, yourself? <laughs> I'm in the middle of, uh, backing up my, my truck and trailer, so I can't really look at it at the moment. Yes, um, yeah, sure can. Go, I'll, all right. I'll go next. Uh, well, these verses here happen to be some of my favorite verses. Of course, I could say that on so many verses, but these really are, uh, amazing had amazing impact on me because i remember so clearly when i first started reading the bible and the effect that it had on me uh my mother had just died and i i reached a point in my life since no one i loved had died at the until then uh, i really wasn't put in a position where i thought i need to have know what happens after we die I need to know what is the purpose of life. So her death made me need answers. And as I read the Bible, uh, I, I can remember the, the the effect it had on me, just like it was today. And I know as I'm reading these portions of scriptures here, it was a very emotional uh, experience that I had. And this is this is what made me love Jesus so much. And, and uh, uh, people have argued with us that you have to scare people into getting saved by the threat of being tortured in hell and that that is a motivating factor for people to get saved. And if you don't have that, they some people would not get saved. Uh, I don't doubt that some people are motivated out of fear, but I, I think God wants us to be, as I was motivated, by the love of God. It's the love of God that drew me to Jesus. And the Bible says that uh, uh, there's no greater love than, than being willing to give your life for someone else. And then in these verses here, uh, you know, I, I thought of myself as I read these verses. For when we were yet without strength and in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. I recognized my ungodliness at that time. And... Uh, um, I mean, some people, they deny their sins, and we know the Bible says all have sinned, so that puts an end to that. 
uh, and the, 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 the Bible says that if you say you have no sin, you're just deceiving yourself. The truth is not in you. So um, if people are going to be at a reach a point in the life where they're going to actually be honest with themselves, they will recognize that this is talking about them. We are the ungodly. Uh, no exceptions. And then, but Christ died for the ungodly. God did not, Christ did not die for the righteous. In verse seven, for, for scarcely, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Uh, yet per adventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. Uh, yeah, so it, it is true. I mean, we, when we say that Jesus loved us so much, he was willing to die for us. Some people could say, well, hey, so what? A lot of people are willing to die for someone. Well, you're willing to die for someone that loves you probably. And if, they, if it's someone that you love, someone in your family that you have, there's a love relationship between you. Many people have, have given their lives to try to save or sacrifice their life for someone, a loved one. It's not that, that uh, unusual. But that doesn't diminish Jesus's death for us because we are not we were not loved ones when when we he died for us we were the ungodly um, and then so God commended commendeth it says his love toward us so, some other translations say God demonstrated his love uh, amplified I think it says God showed or proved his love for us uh towards us in that while we were yet sinners in spite of the fact that we're all sinners even with that in mind christ died for us god loved us so much that even though we are sinners he would be willing to die for us that portion of scriptures uh, was what really inspired me to um become a Christian, to believe and to trust Jesus and to, to, to I, I was overwhelmed when I realized how much Jesus loved me. I'll read this in the Amplified, then we'll get, um, if uh, Steve is back, we'll let him talk about these verses, but I'll read it all in the Amplified. While we were still helpless, that is powerless to provide for our salvation, at the right time, Christ died as a substitute for the ungodly. Now, it is an extraordinary thing for one to willingly give his life even for an upright man, though perhaps for a good man, one who is noble and selfless and worthy, someone might even dare to die. But God clearly shows and proves his own love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. All right, uh, Brother Steve, are you back? Sure. I okay. can take a stab at it. All right. <laughs> um, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Love this verse. This is definitely a favorite of mine as well. Um, there's another verse that talks about uh, how, I think it's in, is it in chapter four, Luke, that talks about uh, the ungodly? Yeah, four, verse five, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, <clears throat> his faith is counted for righteousness. That's chapter four, verse five. So back to verse six, for when we were yet without strength, I mean, wh what does that verse sound like it's saying? Without strength. What does without strength mean? Not able. Not, not have knowing no ability to do anything about uh, our, our, our nature, our, our sin, anything. That, that's, what, that's what Paul is trying to, to say here, I believe, that for when we... We were yet without strength. In due time, Christ died, died for the ungodly. Who's the ungodly? Everybody. <laughs> Every single person that has ever walked the face of this earth because of sin is ungodly. They are 
They have missed the mark. They have fallen from the grace of God, Romans 3.23. So they are ungodly. They are, not, they are no longer possessing what God intended us to possess was the perfection of, of being a, a perfect creature to, to worship God in holiness and in truth. Um, and sin robbed us of, of that, but Christ, in due time, died for the ungodly. So, and he's going on to explain, like, how great of a sacrifice Christ's death really is in verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. So, like, extremely rarely, like, Ain't nobody going to do this very often, okay? <laughs> so, so I'm a little, little slang for you. Just try to put it in uh, today's vernacular. So, you know, uh, yet, for adventure, like, you know, uh, maybe rarely, you know, upon a happenstance, you, you got a good man, uh, or, or, you know, for a good man, some might even dare to die, you know, uh, but he's trying to set, set it up that, you know, most people ain't going to be dying for somebody else. And, and maybe they might, if it's a good person and, and they really want, you know, their, uh, what, what they're doing to, to stay in the earth and would rather give up their life. So, I mean, you know, th there are some people who have done that and, you know, you got firefighters and police and, and different things like that. Uh, and doctors and and whatnot, but it, it, most of us don't do that. Don't have that that feeling like we'd rather put ourselves in in front of the train and try to you know stop keep somebody else from being hurt or or dying and and put our life on the line. So the fact that most people wouldn't would barely even do it for a good person. He's saying Christ died for bad people, not just good people. And really, he said, I didn't come to save the righteous, but sinners. And and we see in this chapter, it's all by it's all accomplished through Jesus, what he did by faith. And uh, in verse eight, but God commended his love toward us. He gave it to us. While we were yet sinners, in the fact that Christ died for us, he's, he's giving us his love through his son. Just like we should be showing the world uh, the love of Christ through us. Uh, so that they can see Christ and believe. Um, and, I, you know... Uh, that Christ died for the ungodly. Well, what's the ungodly? I mean, we did explain that, you know, that's all of us. But, you know, I, I think some of us, especially in other communities, uh, especially like Lordship Salvation, would think the ungodly is is not those uh, like a, a homosexual or a child molester or a Satanist or uh, a, a prostitute or any any number a murderer uh an abortionist these are also the people that christ died for and did that before any of us would ever believe in it he did it from the beginning of time christ the lamb of God was slain for our sins so that by faith, whether they were looking forward to the cross or were looking back to the cross, by faith, we have peace with God. We have justification, sanctification, his, his, his grace and love to walk with us through life, trials and adversities. And we know that he did it before we ever even had the ability to even try to live holy, to even try to live right. 
but God did it before all that. He showed his love in Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. Thanks. Okay. All right. Um, we've all uh, taken a turn on that. So, uh, Brother Cripps, any more follow-up thoughts before we go move on? Uh, no, sir. Just to say that um, I'm I'm very encouraged by these uh, studies. I'm just glad to be here. That's the only thing I want to add. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks. Well, I, I've um, let me respond to what you said, and uh, some in the chat room are saying about the Book of Romans. Uh, obviously, the Book of Romans is fantastic in many ways, and I'm not I'm not trying to really uh, criticize the book in, in itself by any means. But I will say that it's a dangerous book because um, if, if, if you recall, when we did the first, uh, the, the, the first time that we discussed the uh, verses, let's say 10 through chapter 1, verse 10, uh, until uh, 3, verse 19, I think, we, we discussed the prosopopoeia issue. So, um, if, if I'm correct that Paul was using the technique of prosopopoeia in, in that, that portion of scriptures, it totally changes much of the, the, um, the meaning of those verses. Because some of those verses, if prosopopoeia is correct, were not Paul's thoughts at all, not Paul's uh, you know, um, theology, but the, the thoughts and theology of his opponent that he was arguing against. But many people most people are not aware of this and they so they take these things wrong and they think paul is you know this anti-homosexual ranting and raving against homosexuals see look what paul said about it and then we can also get to like romans 9 when we get to romans 9 look what the calvinists do with romans 9 it's they're all calvinism it is based upon the misunderstanding of chapter 9 and, and because they don't understand it correctly, they had, they, they interpret it differently. They, it, they, then they have to go about to change the meanings of all we, I mean, all world, uh, whosoever. They change the meanings of all those words because they have to make it fit with their understanding of Romans chapter 9. Um, and then there's also in, in chapter 10 about uh, Israel, who's the real Israel and all that, and the argument today about who's uh, uh, you know, uh, re replacement theology. or, or there's, there's a lot in the book of Romans that there's a lot of division and argument about some of these things. And so uh, obviously, if you understand it correctly, it's fantastic. <laughs> I think I understand it correctly. But... Uh, Others would say, well, I'm the one that's wrong. But uh, uh, I do believe that uh, there's a lot of uh, areas of the Book of Romans that, uh, that many people are using incorrectly. Same thing that they, they do in the Book of James, using it to justify lordship salvation when, when that's not what, uh, we, how we should understand the Book of James at all. Okay, let's go to verses 9 and 10. It says... Uh, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. I think it's Steve's turn to go first this time. Steve, 9 and 10. Oh boy, my turn to go first, okay? All right. So much more then. So this is another addition here to, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than, this, this is more than just that he died for us, but being now justified, just as if I had never sinned, by his blood, I'm justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So it's, it's not just the fact that we will, 
you know, that, that we're saved, you know, we have eternal life, we're justified, declared, declared uh, sinless, declared holy, all those things that, that we that we've already listed the peace with God, you know, um, all those things that he's been, that he's been talking about. But not only that we're saved through from, from wrath through him. And I believe that's, that's uh, talking about the, the wrath of God poured out on, on, on earth in revelation that we're saved from that wrath because that wrath is poured out on on sinners who didn't believe. And I think, you know, even in God's wrath, his love is still there because they've refused him up until this point, demanding a sign. Well, he finally gives them what they want. In his wrath, he still is trying to prove that he is real, that he really did die for them, but he has to pour out his wrath at some point on 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 those that have refused Christ over and over and over and over and over again. But those of us who by faith have believed the gospel, have peace with God, we, the, the wrath of God was poured out on Christ. So, you know, um, it, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, so I, I don't know if we did 10 as well, Luke. Why don't you know that? Weren't you listening? Yes, I was listening. Yes, I was yeah, listening. I'm also, I'm also yeah. doing a little bit more work than normal at the moment. So, all right, go ahead. Uh, ten as well. Okay. So, uh, for if when we were enemies, like like I said earlier, that's why we have peace with God at the very beginning of this chapter. We have peace with God by faith through Jesus Christ our Lord. And he's he's going on to say when we were enemies. Is it th this this for if is directly linked with with the previous verse, verse nine, because of our faith, we're justified, we're saved from wrath, because when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more. Being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So, um, because we were enemies, we now may have peace with God. We're no longer his enemies because we were reconciled. Reconciled, uh, Luke, you mentioned financial, fi financial transaction terms with justification. Uh, reconciled or redeemed. Um, bought back, joined back together. Uh, they're very similar in, in what they're saying, you know, that we were reconciled, we were, bought, we were redeemed, we were bought back, we were bought by Christ. He, he owns us, we're no longer our own, we're, we are his, because we were bought with a price, as, as Paul is saying, by the death of his son. And much more than just that, much more than just being justified, much more than just being uh, reconciled, and much more than just having peace with God and, and all these things, we also are saved by his life, not just by his death. Uh, and this reminds me of the book of Hebrews when it says we have a high priest who ever liveth making intercession for us. Um. And and so, like some people talk about that, his life, the life he lived, that's also true, because we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses because he was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. So we're saved by the life he lived, by his death, because he shed his blood to, to cover and to purge our sins. And also by his life everlasting that he lives after that to make intercession for us and, con and continue to pour out his grace on us perpetually, permanently, forever. Um, some of these words would be interesting to, to show on a deeper context that uh, when, when it's using the words, I think, when it says being now justified... Is a is a in the Greek, 
they have verbs that are in the perfect tense. So when that's perfect tense, it's it's past, present, future tense. So it, it's perfectly covering all all tenses it could cover, like past, present, and future, all in one. Being now justified. The ED is is present, past, being, I am now, and and now forever. I mean, it's it's something like that. Uh, I'm not a Greek scholar by any means, but I've I've learned some of those things from from uh, listening to scholars uh, teach those things. Uh, but it's it's just awesome. Did we do eleven as well? Nope. Only nope. Okay. Crips now for nine and okay. ten. Thank you, Steve. All right. Thank you. Good stuff, Steve. And you don't have to be a Greek scholar to understand uh, the word justified, but you do understand it very well, which is uh, which is great. Yeah. So it's all all tenses of the word, uh, and and that's the way sanctification is too. We've talked about that on on the show, and um, you know, being being sanctified. That's not what's in the verse. I'm just saying it has that same. Um, uh, way of meeting all tenses at once, and that's the way God is. He, he uh, with time, in fact, um, being able being able to see everything from the beginning, during, and at the end, and that's what justified. Uh, that's what Steve was getting at there. So you don't have to be um, uh, a scholar of any kind. That's that's the beauty and simplicity of His Word is that with the help of the Holy Spirit, you can understand yourself. You don't have to go to other men. Um, fellowships like these are great. You know, we're, we're not telling you to listen just to us. We're telling you to get in the word and that's what we're doing. It's uh, uh, brother Luke amplifies it by, you know, uh, we all amplify it by, by uh, expounding a little bit more and you can do all this uh, yourselves too. Um so uh, verse nine, much more than being now justified. So what else is, what else do we get in this huge package of things, which is a gift from God, not, not just being justified by his blood, but we're saved from wrath through him. Uh, what a wonderful thing. We don't have to go through wrath. Brother Luke was talking earlier about being frustrated with people using fear as a way to bring people to God. Now, do people come through fear to God? Yeah, yeah, they 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 they'll come over when you talk about sinners in the hands of an angry God. Oh, holding you above the flames. We do deserve the flame. I'm not saying we don't deserve it. We deserve to be separated from God. We deserve it. But this verse is saying we don't. We're not going to have to to experience the wrath of God. And who is the wrath of God aimed at in the first place? The ungodly. Those that did not accept his free gift. So ask yourself the question, are you part of the ungodly or are you part of God's children? Are you part of the body of Christ? If you can say honestly that you're part of the body of Christ, this verse is for you. We're saved from the wrath through him, through what Christ did on the cross. Again, the imputed righteousness. So people can use fear all they want. They can use the threat of hell. They can use all that, the biggest thing that I see that would be worse than thinking about your body being in flames forever, which is separation from the creator, separation from our father that made us and loved us, separated from the son. I want to be with him. He did all this for me from the beginning of time before I was ever born. He sent his son into the world for verse 10. For if we were enemies... We're, we are we were enemies before we accept his free gift we are enemies we are at enmity with God we're born into this we're all born into en enmity with God but we have the chance we have the opportunity to accept what was already done before we were born and then we're reconciled to God by the death of his son Reconciled is a huge word. It's one of my favorite words. When, when I get moved by a story or a movie or a song, the biggest thing that moves me every time is any idea of reconciliation. You know, you have, you have families that are at odds with each other and, you know, they have huge fights and there's all this backbiting and, and, and other things that go on. 
And then you have a moment where one person is touched by God and he goes to the other family members and says to him, you know, I've been wrong and I'm sorry. I really am. Please forgive me. And then when you have the rest of the family able to forgive them and, and you feel this reconciliation that happens. And I've said this before and I'll keep, I'll keep preaching it that the Bible is not a, a, a book of do's and don'ts. It is a love letter to us. It is God showing us how much he loved us. He loved us so much that he sent his son into the world to reconcile us to him. How do we get there? We get, we get there through the way, the truth, and the life, which is Christ. God's son, the death on the cross, which is in this verse much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So in the first verse, we're saved from the wrath. And then verse 10, saved by his life, the very life that he gave up on the cross willingly. He was not murdered. He gave his life up. Didn't he say that he had the power to give up his life and take it back up again? He did. And that's exactly what he did. He willingly gave up his life for us because he loved us because he was doing the will of his father who wanted to reconcile us to him. And that's that's exactly what he did. So um, going back to a point um, Steve made earlier about the debt, the reckon the debt in our accounts, that was, a, that was a great way to say it. And I've thought of that as well, that we have an account that pays for everything that we've ever done. It's already been set up in your name. Don't have your name blotted out by not receiving that gift. Your name's already on the account. God wrote your name in his own blood, in, in Christ's blood, for your account. But it can sit at the bank all at once. But if you go and claim it, then your debt is all forgiven. You don't ever have to pay it. You're saved by his life. The life is the very life that he gave up willingly on the cross. It's beautiful. Verse 10, verse 9 and verse 10. Beautiful. That's all. Thanks, guys. <coughs> Hey, thank you. Um, well, okay, I'll just read it and talk about it. Much more than, uh, of course, much more than is, is connecting the previous thoughts to what he's saying next, even more so than what it, the points I've made before, being now justified by his blood. It's done. Yeah, we, we are presently justified, Paul's saying. We are justified by the blood. Now justified by the blood. We have to wait some point in the future for this to happen. It's it's done. It's justified. Is uh, uh, We shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, Brother Steve, I... Uh, I, uh, I respect your opinion. We talked about this, I think, yesterday in the in the private uh, fellowship about our views on eschatology and, you know, end times and how that's going to all play out and stuff. And uh, is the church going to have to have any wrath uh, in the end times? And and uh, I don't think the church is going to have any wrath from God in end times. That 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 will be uh, on the world, but but not on 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 us uh, believers. But uh, I believe that particular verse shall be saved from wrath through him should be understood as we, uh, the wrath was placed on Jesus on the cross. The wrath is already, of God has already been, you know, um, placed, placed where it should be on the Savior. Um it may be, you may be right. I looked up the uh, in the Amplified what it would say on that while you're talking, and uh, I'll read that. It says, uh, "Therefore, since we have now been justified, that is declared free from the guilt of sin by His blood, how much more certain is it that we will be saved from the wrath of God through Him?" Now that doesn't explain a lot, but there's a, a letter B there on wrath. It's a footnote. And when I look at it, it says, uh, Romans 5, 9, the wrath of God with the definite article in Greek anticipates the outpouring of God's wrath on rebellious sinners in the tribulation period. Revelation 6, 16 and 17. So 
uh, I've been disappointed when we talk about, you know, this, uh, how much I like this uh, amplified uh, version, you know, how helpful it can be, but it's it's not perfect. Once in a while, there, there'll, there'll be a serious objection I have to it. And then other times, I, I now I'm realizing that the amplified translators are, are a part of the, the, the majority viewpoint in America today that hold to dispensational futurism. As I said, most America believes it because for the last 150 years, that's been, what's been taught. Uh, Darby uh, wrote about it. Schofield took Darby's viewpoints and put them in, in footnotes in his Bible called the Schofield Reference Bible. And the Schofield Reference Bible was the, the textbook for all seminaries in America, pretty much, for the last 150 years. So all the pastors and the theologians in America for all a century have learned that from the Schofield Reference Bible. So they, they, uh, they basically have been uh, all taught this viewpoint. And that's, that's the way you're supposed to understand this verse. Um, but so you are, they are supporting your position, Brother Steve. And maybe you're right. I mean, I'm not saying I'm absolutely right on it, but I don't, I don't hold to that um, eschatol eschatological viewpoint any longer. So I think that this, when it says "shall be," uh, I'm sorry, "shall be saved from wrath through Him," that's referencing also the wrath was put on. We don't have to get the wrath put on us because the wrath of God was put on Jesus on the cross. That's how I would under understand it. Then verse 10 says, "For if when we were enemies." We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Uh, now, what does that mean, shall be saved by his life? Uh, I, mean, I, I, I think that we're, we're saved because uh, Jesus died for my sins. What's his life have to do about it? it uh, well, there's two lives of Jesus. Uh, you had his... Uh, from his birth till his death, that period of his ministry on earth, uh, and in that perfect life that he lived, living a life without sin, his perfect life, his righteousness is credited to us. So I can see how in that way we're saved by his life because we get his imputed righteousness on us. But another way of looking at his life would be uh, his resurrection, that now, hey, he is alive. And when we look at the Amplified on that, uh, and that's how it interprets it. It says, um, um, "For if while we were enemies, we, we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. It is much more certain, having been reconciled, that we will be saved. That is, from the consequences of sin by His life. That is, we will be saved because Christ lives today." So when they're taking it, when it says saved by his life, that because he's risen, because he's risen, I, hey, he can't save anybody if he's still dead, right? He has to be risen and alive to be able to save us. Um, all right, um, that's, a, that's enough uh, for me, but uh, any follow-up thoughts from either of you? Sure. Um... If I may, uh, I wasn't trying to get into the eschatological stuff. I was just merely saying that no matter what our point on uh, a view of, uh, since you brought that up, no matter what our point of view of eschatology, I think we can all agree that this verse simply states that, you know, the wrath of God was poured out on Christ. And those of us that believe will never experience the wrath of God because it was poured out on Christ. Whether, whether, no matter what our eschatological view, that is a promise from God to us that we will never experience the wrath of God, which was poured out on Christ. There may be other wraths that we might experience, uh, but I think we can agree <laughs> um, that, uh, you know, his, that Christ took the wrath he took the punishment for our sin he you know there's no there's no more uh there's no more punishment for sin uh with with that in mind because of the for those of us that believe um 
especially for an eternal context, um, you know, we are not going to face the second death um, and all of those kinds of things. So the, the wrath of God was poured out on Christ because of him by faith through Jesus Christ and all these things, including we will not experience the wrath of God. That's all I wanted to say there. Well, Steve, I don't want to make you uncomfortable and feel defensive like you're not free to talk about a, a subject. Uh, so uh, I hope you don't take it that way. Uh, if you if you see a verse like this and you think that applies to uh, the tribulation, say it. I want to hear it. Everybody should hear it. And uh, I don't want to. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that in this case, okay. I think that it, <laughs> it's applying to the wrath put on Jesus on the cross. You think it's applied to the, the uh, tribulation period, and uh, this particular uh, amplified version is on your side of that question. Okay. <laughs> right, right. And no, no, I, I wasn't feeling that. I was just, you know, because I'm on your channel, I want to respect your your viewpoints, but I do appreciate, uh, you know, that, and, and I, I do know that. And um, uh, I do see the tribulation period not being the wrath poured out period. Uh, I think to me, they're two separate uh, periods of time, but you know, uh, w whether I'm right on that or, or wrong on that, what I do understand is that, uh, that because Christ, because of what Christ did and because God poured his wrath out on Christ, that by faith, that we have that promise that those of us that have believed the gospel will not experience wrath in any way, shape, or form from God because it was poured out on Christ for us that would believe. That That's really the more like important point to me. What, no matter what view of eschatology we have, that, that, the, that we, are, we are not appointed to wrath because Christ took the wrath. You know, it's like, you know, what you're saying, you know, God's love brought us to us. You know, we don't have to experience his wrath because of what Christ did. And by faith, we have received, you know, Christ's intermediary sacrifice where he took our place so that we don't have to experience the wrath because he experienced it for us. You know, um, I, I, to me, it's just a beautiful promise, irregardless of. And I do think it's talking about when the when the bowls of wrath are poured out on the earth. I do think that, but I think that's a separate time from tribulation. Um, and if we're here through tribulation, so be it. But I don't believe we'll be here when the bowls of wrath, bowls of God's wrath, are poured out on the earth. Either we won't be here, or we will be supernaturally protected from it because of what Christ did because of that so that's that's just how i how i see it but i do think it's a beautiful promise to yeah. us okay uh oh i need to uh change the subject for a moment here i see stacy cook uh boy it's i'm heartbroken for you stacy um, she wrote in the chat just want to let you guys know i lost my dad last week you all prayed for me and funeral went amazing I felt the Lord there. He helped me stand up and talk at the funeral and say the prayer. Thanks. Uh, I hope everybody continues praying for you and your family. I know it's, you know, your grief does not end in a, in a moment. It, it, there's a, uh, I hope that uh, maybe if there's anybody in your family that's uh, not saved or if, maybe ridiculed, you know, or, um, religion and Christianity at any point that uh, maybe what something will happen like happened with me in my case. I, I've said earlier that it was my mother's death that made me reach a point where I, I, I wanted to know what happens after we die. So sometimes uh, I've always said that my mother had to die so I could live and you know, get life everlasting to make me uh, shock me into looking for looking for answers. Uh, all right, the next uh, scriptures are uh, verse 11, 12, and 13. I'll read those now. 
And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Okay, I think it's uh, Brother Cripp's turn. I keep losing track. Are you could you guys remember who went first? I can't remember that for some reason. Yeah, that's uh, me. Did you to go first? Yep. Okay, go ahead, brother. Yeah, verse 11, and not only so, but we also joy in God. Joy. Absolute joy that comes from God with all the stuff that we've already discussed and having the um, the righteousness of, of the Son imputed unto us. We're not under wrath. We just talked about that. We're being reconciled to God. So what, what does that produce in us? Joy in God through what Christ did on the cross by whom we have now received the atonement. So that's the thing that we receive at the cross. What do we receive? It's atonement. That is the imputed righteousness on us. That is the payment for our sin, that we don't have to suffer the wrath. Which, by the way, I wasn't there for the discussion that spurred on that little little uh, conversation uh, up there, but um, I would love to flub the way in on that. So we'll talk about that more some other time as far as tribulation and uh, what happens in that case. But um, So the atonement is the big thing in this uh, particular verse, and also the joy that comes from everything that we've already discussed in realizing that, that you've received this and that you're not under wrath. Wherefore, as by one man's sin entered the world, one man's sin is Adam. Adam's sin entered into the world, and the penalty is death. And we're all born into that. That's why we're dead. We're born dead. I mean, our parents are happy. With, you know, hopefully you're in a situation where when you were born, your parents were happy that you were in the world, but you were born dead. And you had no choice in the matter. But the beauty of it is the choice is you can be alive because of what Christ did on the cross. So death passed upon all men from one man's sin. So because of the sin of, sin of Adam, um, all men are born under under that that same penalty uh, and the uh, the penalty of death and um, uh, sin being passed on us. For that we all have sinned. So it's just it's just saying the same thing I just said that all of us have sinned. There's not one person that hasn't sinned. It's not been born into sin. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. So in order for there to be any imputation, there has to be, the first have to be sin. And certainly in our case, there there was. That's that same uh, setup from the beginning of, uh, of the garden where the sin was committed, and then we're all born into that. Um, if there wasn't if there wasn't any any sin, I mean, if there wasn't any law, there then there wouldn't be sin. Uh, but fortunately for us, that's the situation, and it it was all taken care of at the cross. Your debt was paid, and 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 again, it's the same thing. It's it's um, accepting it and having faith in it, and then all these things are yours. I love the idea of having joy in God, even through tribulations. We glory in the tribulations, and then we receive the joy that comes from the realization that Christ already did it all, and uh, we're uh, free from the wrath. Great stuff. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And Brother Steve? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so that would be 11 and 12, right? Am I correct? No, or you're just 11. 11, 12, just 11. And, no, 11, 12, and 13. Yeah. 11, okay. And okay. All right, Steve. Come on, All man. All right. Woo -woo. Woo -woo. <laughs> Let's take the train home, buddy. Let's take it home. All right. All right. All right. All right. So, uh, I love, I love how the, the, 
these were these these verses read like this and not only so here again it's like paul's like we started out at the beginning of the chapter with therefore we have peace with god and then we see all these things that you know by faith all these things that that we have through christ by faith and not only will we be saved by his life, in verse 11, not only so, not only just saved by his life and reconciled and all those things, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. The atonement, the, the, if you don't understand this, this word atonement, it comes from the the, the Old Testament in, in which they did sacrifices that only atoned for the year, and that was only for earthly blessing and cursing. Only for earthly life or, or death for, for just one year. But this atonement, as it's stated in Hebrews, was, was done forever. It's perfect atonement. It's that 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 his that Christ ever liveth and his blood ever intercedeth for us, atoning for, for us forever. Um from from before till now till the future, forever. It, that's why we have all these things and we have joy. On top of all this other stuff that we get by faith, we have joy in God through Jesus Christ because we have received the atonement, the cleansing, the purging of sin once for all forever. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, that would be Adam, and death by sin. So the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So death, because of one man, Sin entered into the world, and death, that punishment that Christ paid for, death entered into the world because of sin. So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So this is a great verse right here also, verse 13, that because there is no law, that there is no sin imputed without the law. So that's why we believe a child, though born into the world in sin, is still covered by grace because they have not come to, until they come to a place where the law imputes sin upon them because they come to a place in life where they're able to understand those things until then sin is not imputed on them because there was no law yet in in their consciousness in in their understanding um so i think that's just that's just great i i love that uh that verse and it's also goes towards the fact that we are not under law but we are under grace so because we are under grace and not under law any longer, there is no sin imputed because there is no law because we have stepped out of law and into the law of grace, the law of faith, not the law of, of the Old Testament, not the deeds of the law, which, by, uh, which no flesh shall be justified ever by the deeds of the law. And that's either to keep the law or, or to not break it, or to be doing things that are in the law, whether it's your righteousness or not doing sin, none of that ever has ever justified flesh, ever. For by the law, no flesh is justified. And so because of that, we're now under grace, and we are taken out of the law and its requirements because Christ fulfilled the requirements for us that's why not only in his life on earth and now in his resurrected life, we have 
been saved by his life, both lives, because he lived it perfectly so he could give us his imputed righteousness by grace, through, through faith, through Jesus Christ alone. And therefore, we are not uh, no longer under law. Therefore, sin is no longer imputed unto us in verse 13. Brother Steve, it, as I listen to you, it, 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 it seems to me that you understand the gospel. Amen. I hope so. That's the one thing I do want to understand above all else. That's the one thing I want to understand and, and have right and have it even more right and be even better at explaining it in the future. Amen. I, I want to have it all, all nailed down, even though I already believe I, I have it nailed down in its simplicity for sure. I want to have it nailed down in, in the complexities that are also there. Yeah. And I think that's part of putting on my helmet of salvation. Well, in these, three verses, reminding me. in these three verses, there's a basically two things I want to focus on. One and first is this word atonement. Uh, I've talked about this already, but not everybody has heard every one of my videos and every word I've spoken. So I'm going to repeat it because most people probably haven't heard this. But if you go to my Sin City Preacher YouTube homepage, on the right-hand column, there's a few channels that I'm, are recommended channels. At the top of the list is says 777 New Covenant. And that's a collection of uh, sermons by uh, Aaron Budgen. I made a video, my two favorite Bible teachers, Aaron Budgen and Malcolm Smith. Uh, I hope you'll subscribe to those and start watching their videos. You know, it'd be helpful to everybody. But Aaron Budgen grew up uh, Jewish, and he was studying to be a rabbi. And then he ended up coming to the conclusion that the Messiah came. It was Jesus, and he, he started, he believed, and, and he ended up, so he's able to teach the Bible, and he understands the gospel as we do. But he's able to teach it and give us insights from a Jewish perspective that most people are not, don't have that kind of understanding. So it can be very helpful. But he does have a video that he makes a really big deal about the words atonement and propitiation. I think Aaron Budgen would take this verse here when it says atonement and have an issue with the KJV's use of that word atonement. Because according to Aaron Budgen, and, and I think he knows better than I do about this, so I, I trust his conclusion. But the word atonement should only be used uh, we're talking about the um, animal sacrifices in uh, uh, Mosaic laws, because that that was uh, could be just rightly called atonement, because atonement means to cover up something, and it's only temporary, and it's not. It's not really removed, it's only covered. So, so it's like out of sight, out of mind. Uh, uh, so if you think of the sins before Jesus paid for our sins, the, the, in uh, Judaism, they would do the animal sacrifices for atonement. It wasn't a real solution to the problem. All the people who died believing in uh, this picture of salvation that someday someone would actually die for our sins and that blood sacrifice would actually solve the sin problem, this future savior that was promised, uh, they would be saved and wait for in uh, Hades. Is, the Bible uses these words, uh, Tartarus, hell, uh, hell, Hades, uh, and uh, people get confused as to what each one means, but Hades is an area where people are waiting. The, in the, before Jesus went and uh, after his death and burial, uh, this changed. But before his death and burial, he uh, people were waiting for this sin payment and the resurrection. Um, they, they were not, their sins weren't actually paid for, even though through the animal sacrifices, they were expressing their faith that someday they would be paid for. Uh, so that's atonement. We should only use the word atonement in that regard. Propitiation is the word that we should use 
talking about what Jesus has done for us, because it's not just simply covering up the sins and out of sight, out of mind temporarily. It's a, it's the, uh, the final solution. When Jesus says, it is finished, that means, okay, no more sin issue. There's no more an issue between man and God over sin. It's like people say the difference between religion and Christianity is in religion, it's do, do, do. But in Christianity, it's done. Jesus said on the cross, it's done. Actually, he said, it's finished is the translation, but it's done. You don't have to do anything. I did it all. So that's propitiation. It's done. It's finished. Paid in full. Sufficient payment was made. Nothing else is required. That's how we should understand propitiation. And that's why this word probably should be propitiation here. If you, you listen to Aaron Budgen. Uh, now, the other thing I want to talk about in these verses here is verse 13, because Hendricks says he's puzzled by verse 13. I'm going to read all these verses in the Amplified, and then I'll focus on verse 13. It says, uh, um, not only that, but we also rejoice in God, rejoicing in his love and perfection through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received and enjoy our reconciliation with God. All right, that's obvious. No reason to explain that further. Verse 12, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all people, no one being able to stop it or escape its power because they all sinned. Sin was committed in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged against anyone when there is no law against it. Okay, so I think in the Amplified, Hendricks, you can better understand this distinction that's being made here. It's not that sin did not exist before the law. It says sin was committed in the world before the law was given. Let me see. Uh, in verse 13, for until the law of sin was in the world. See, so there was sin in the world. For sin to exist, you don't have to have the law written down. It's still sin. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. That is what it says in the KJV. Uh, but sin is not charged against anyone when there is no law against it. So a person might think, well, hey, there's until the law was written down, the law of Moses, but we know that the law of Moses really was only written down and given to the, the uh, Israel, never was given to the Gentile world, but it, the Bible, Paul tells us that uh, the Gentiles still have law, It's but it's the law of conscience written in our heart. The law was written in our heart. It's it, our conscience that God gives us, the understanding of right and wrong. We inherited it from Adam and Eve because they ate from the tree the knowledge of good and evil, and they then they learned uh, they developed a conscience. They knew what right and wrong was, and and we we inherited that. But really, to me, the distinction that's important to understand is that I've made a lot of videos talking about the two problems. A lot of people think that, well, there's a problem, and it's man's a sinner, and you got to pay for your sin, or or Jesus paid for your sin. But uh, there's two problems: sin and death. So. Um, uh, imputed or not imputed because of law being there or not being there. The real problem is the fact that everybody is born with a death sentence. That's the real problem. Uh, because at some point, Jesus would pay for everybody's sin. So sin's no longer a problem. This, the temple curtain separated the Holy of Holies was torn in half from top to bottom, when showing that the outer area now and the Holy of Holy areas was not separated by that uh, curtain. Uh, that indicated that uh, there's no longer a barrier between man and God. Man and God can actually have a relationship because the sin barrier was removed. So Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world. This is where 
a lot of people miss this understanding that he didn't just pay for our sins in this congregation who believe in Jesus and and uh, were saved and where uh, he paid for the sins of the whole world. The Bible says he's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So if, if Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world, then sin is no longer an issue between man and God. Any person can have a relationship with God now because Jesus paid for the sin. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is the death sentence. Man still has a death sentence on him, and that the only remedy to that is to receive the gift of eternal life. So even though, I, that's why I think the judgment is going to be so ironic and heartbreaking. When someone goes up to that judgment and they're told, look, look at all the sin in your life. People don't recognize how sinful their lives are. But at the judgment, all their sins will be shown. They'll recognize how sinful they were. And it says, but look, Jesus paid for all your sins. And here's all the time, Brother Luke told you about it, and Matthias told you about it, Steve told you about it. Everybody was telling you, but Jesus paid for your sins, but you were stubborn and rejected Jesus, and you would not accept the gift of life. So that's why this understanding that man is not innately immortal. The, 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 here, here's in this last verse, it's, uh, it says it there, uh, Verse 13, in, it says, um, uh, verse 13, sin was committed in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone when there is no law against it. Verse 14, I know I'm jumping ahead. Yet death ruled over mankind from Adam to Moses. See, so even before the law was given, and uh, there's this distinction of, well, it's not charged against you if you don't know it's against the law, but that doesn't matter. It, because it, even if sin wasn't an issue, man still has a death sentence that needs to be either we die or get life. And uh, so the, the important thing for people to understand is that uh, uh, the people, people, I've heard people say, well, what is really the problem? Is it the, the problem of what, what man does or is the problem what man is? I say the problem is what man is. And um, what is he? Well, some people say, well, man's uh, born a sinner. That's not what I'm talking about. The fact that man's born with a, a nature that will event, eventually sin, um, that problem, I said, is already resolved because we're reconciled. Jesus paid for everybody's sin. But the problem that is not solved for people is the death sentence, mortality. So it's, a, it's what we are. The problem is not what we do. Jesus paid for our actions. But the problem is what we are. We're mortal. And in, until we receive immortality, we have this death sentence on us. Oh, we're going to die, and we'll, everybody will be resurrected because God wants to give everybody a, a, a hearing and sh show them his, his justice. And, uh, uh, but those people who uh, will not receive the gift of life, immortality, um, they're going to go to that judgment and knowing that that death sentence was not was not removed for them, they still are under the sentence of death, so they'll die the second death. Uh, okay, that's how I see Hendrix. That's how I see that verse thirteen and even and fourteen going going along with it. Um, okay, um, let me see. We're out of time, so we won't kind of have any more verses, but. Just uh, is it, do you, either of you want to respond any more to this last three verses we talked about? Uh, I think I said everything I want to say, man. All right, <laughs> let's, let's let each take a, a minute or two to sum up our thoughts. Let's see if also if there's anything in the chat room. I don't if there's anything in all caps that we need to uh, address. Uh, 
that would be something you want us to respond to a statement or a question and i'm not seeing any so if you do have a question that you want us to talk about before we finish for the night put it do it put it in there now uh so uh, brother uh steve let me ask you first to kind of sum up your thoughts on the study tonight um Okay, uh, I was hoping we could get through to 15 because I think it really sums up the verse 12 there. <coughs> but, um, uh, and what you were talking about, um, I think verse 15 kind of sums up a lot of what Paul has been talking about. But I think it's just awesome that, you know, the all these verses is talking about in chapter five from, from the start there, that, that all of this is accomplished by faith through Christ, through his grace, not anything we do like, you know, in, in verse 15, it, it clarifies verse 12. If, if I could just read that one real quick. Um, no, you can't, man. Uh... <laughs> I've got, so, a, I've got a peanut butter banana and man. <laughs> man, come on. So, yeah. uh, come on, man. Uh, all right, uh, I'll just read, read, read twelve, and then read fifteen. Wherefore, as by one man, by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all, for that all have sinned, but not as the offense. So also is it is the free gift, for if through the offense of one many be dead much more the grace of god and the gift by grace which is by one man one 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 man jesus christ hath abounded unto many so this grace doesn't come from me doesn't come from my my actions doesn't come from anybody's actions just like sin went upon all men, because of one man, grace will go upon many. And the reason it says many, not all, like sin, is because not everybody's going to believe it. And that's a sad, sad thing that, that one would reject a free gift. And all these promises that were given in chapter 5, especially to go through the trials and tribulations of life without the comforter to walk through through it with you. I mean, why would you want to ignore even even just that part? I mean, you know, uh, not only the the eternal life part, but to have a comforter to walk with you through the trials of life and be able to comfort you through them. I mean, that that is such a beautiful thing, and so many don't want it, and I don't understand it. It's like it boggles my mind uh, that that you know you would reject comfort and and reject grace and reject all these things that are only uh, just just by faith, by grace through Jesus Christ. You don't have to do anything for it. Just believe it. It's all yours. All this is yours. Everything we've talked about today from this chapter is yours. Waiting to be given to you. Just, just God is just waiting to give it to you if you will believe him. So I, I just encourage you to believe him and have, have these things. Ha have assurance of of your salvation, have assurance that you have eternal life because of what Jesus did, because he said so, because he, he tells you to believe it and you have eternal life and not just eternal life, but grace in this life to walk through this life that the Holy Spirit will walk through it with you and you'll have love shed abroad in your heart. You'll be justified, sanctified forever. And you get all that. And that sin is no longer imputed upon your account. But grace is imputed upon your account. His righteousness is imputed upon your account forever. And that it'll walk with you through this life. It's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I hope that, that you understand that, that God's love is so vast. It's so boundless. It's so 
so deep, so broad, we can't even measure it. We can't even measure right now the deepest parts of the earth in the ocean. And God says his love is deeper and wider than the depths of the entire ocean for you. So that would be my sum up thought. That his love is that wide, that deep, we can't even measure it, even in natural means. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Brother Cripps. Uh, I'm just going to agree with what that man said right there. I think that's, uh, that's the way to go. Uh, it's phenomenal. Uh, as far as my perspective goes, as I said, kind of at the beginning, these the one th one through eight is just so meaningful in my life. It always has been and always will be. And uh, even though Steve uh, skipped ahead to verse fifteen, that that uh, that does help sum it up. But I like to do things in order, so I'm looking forward to next week. Right? Are we doing something Wednesday? Is Wednesday Christmas or is it? Uh, Tuesday. Brother Luke? Uh, yeah, the uh, Christmas is Tuesday, so next week's Wednesday Bible study is scheduled. We will do it. Okay, perfect. Um, I think I've added everything I want to add, and I just want to say, are we doing uh, good night to the chat room now, or are we going to, is this is this my only closing here? Okay, yeah, so good night to the chat room. It's always a pleasure to be in here with you guys, and uh, thanks for all your comments. There's some really good comments in there tonight, and uh, let's keep praying for Renee. I was glad to see her. I don't know if Brother Luke saw that or not, but she popped in here for a little bit, and we had a chance to say we're praying for her, and we love her. And um, uh, thanks to you, Brother Luke. Obviously, th I always enjoy being a part of the uh, Bible study and brother Steve always a pleasure as you very well know sir I hope that you guys have a great week and I'll see you guys next time hey amen and thank you uh, I want to thank both of you for participating and also the chat room that uh, our chat rooms are so wonderful they're uh, they, they're the maturity level I see in our chat rooms is it's a blessing to me. And I, I have seen the chat room change over the last year. I remember initially there were people who were disagreeing and not being very nice about it. <laughs> and everybody's learned that, Hey, we can disagree, but let's go out of our way to be nice to each other, even when we're disagreeing. And so I just see a wonderful, uh, kind, uh, room with it has peace and fellowship so thank you so much and also to the all the, the moderators in the chat room who are so helpful to uh you know moderate make sure that you know the things don't get go off in some crazy direction and we don't have a, if we do have a troll to immediately take care of it so i thank you very much again for that i saw a comment that from uh, mark brother mark uh cased over about uh, Amanda Gill needing prayer. So everybody, God knows what the need is. I'm not sure what it is, but everybody please pray for uh, Amanda Gill's needs. And of course, Sister Renee, you know you know what she's dealing with. Hopefully she's, it'll be a miracle. I think it's gonna take a miracle. I, I think her situation is so bad that uh, there doesn't seem to be a surgery or a, med a medicine that's gonna fix it. If it gets six, it's got to be God that does it. So let's keep praying. Uh, we want her and need her back with us. She's usually with me every Sunday and Wednesday. And uh, not only do I miss her, but everybody misses her. Um, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, next Wednesday, we'll pick up where we left off. Uh, chapter 5, verse 14. We'll begin right there and continue on. Um, Thanks, uh, and the, the discussion was great. Uh, I always like to get everybody's, uh, both both of your viewpoints are interesting. And uh, so don't forget, oh, by the way, uh, Brother uh, Alex, I saw him in the chat room, there he is. Uh, he, he's going to be interviewed by me uh, day after tomorrow, Friday. You know, we have the Friday night interviews now. That's about, uh, let me see, I think we're gonna start that at five, 
5 p.m. Pacific. That'll be 10 p.m. in Chile. So um, 5 p.m. Pacific, uh, uh, we're going to interview Brother Alex. Don't forget to join us for that interview. And if you haven't seen the other interviews, um, it, uh, go to my playlist titled Interviews. And uh, there's probably about eight or ten interviews I've done so far. Eventually, I want to get everybody here interviewed. Uh, um, Brother Cripps and Brother Steve has been interviewed. Uh, many, many others. Uh, but all of you, Brother Mark and Anna, and uh, I have only one sister interview. That's Sister Renee. They're all. I don't want anybody to think that I'm only interviewing the men. I want to interview the sisters. So uh, I will be trying to contact you and ask you to for a date some Friday night to be, be interviewed. But <clears throat> if you're uh, particularly interested. Uh, Sister Celine has wanted to be interviewed, but she hasn't been able to make her schedule fit with this uh, Friday night schedule. So uh, uh, if you're anxious to be interviewed, just contact me and I'll schedule it. And if you're not so anxious, eventually I'll hunt you down because I, I want every person in our congregation to be interviewed so that I can get to know you personally. And everybody in the congregation can get to know each other better. All right. Uh, I guess that's it. Uh, thanks, thanks to everybody for participating. I uh, look forward to seeing you uh, next. We'll be on Friday and then on the Sunday program uh, in church on Sunday. So bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.